Hi everyone! In this video, we will discuss what are hyperelastic material models, where are they used, and how to calibrate them by curve fitting them to data in Workbench. Let's go! Hyperelastic materials are a class of materials that can undergo deformations as large as 40% and sustain zero to negligible plastic deformation. Materials such as rubbers, elastomers, soft tissues and foams typically exhibit this behavior. The materials in this class share some common traits, such as they are soft in nature compared to most metals, their stress versus strain response is nonlinear and monotonically increasing. Their stress versus strain curve follows the same path during loading and unloading. This implies that all the work done in deforming them is conserved and it's stored as internal energy, which is fully recovered up on unloading. This attribute of such materials is used in defining their constitutive model in terms of strain energy density, which is the amount of internal energy stored in a unit volume of the material. The strain energy density is a function of the strain in the material and the stresses developed in it are calculated based on the mode of deformation, so the response can differ depending on how the material is deformed. So, to summarize, because of the complex stress-strain relationship of elastomeric materials, hyperelasticity is typically defined with an equation called a strain energy potential. Our challenge is to determine those coefficients of the equation in order to categorize our material property, and that's where experimental data from control experiments come into play. Typically, we perform tests in three modes of deformation and calibrate or curve fit for our hyperelastic coefficients. These three modes of deformation are uniaxial tension, uniaxial compression, or biaxial tension, and in shear. In addition to these, we also perform confined compression tests to calculate its volumetric response. Together, these four data sets comprise a full set of data required to accurately calibrate hyperelastic materials. In case of materials that are either fully or nearly incompressible, one may ignore the volumetric data under the assumption that the material is fully incompressible. It's worth noting that in practice, one may calibrate the hyperelastic model using test data in only one of these three modes of deformation. In such cases, the model response may be reliable in only that mode of deformation. Therefore, while it's possible to calibrate these modes using data from only one mode of deformation, it is highly recommended to use data from multiple or all three modes of deformation. The calibration of material model involves selecting a hyperelastic model and curve fitted to the available experimental data. As a result, we get constants, which are considered as material properties. There are several hyperelastic material models available in ANSYS Mechanical that a user can pick from and perform curve fitting inside engineering data. When we perform curve fitting, we are calculating the cumulative mismatch between the experimental data and model prediction and minimize this value for an optimal set of material constants. This error function is called as least square function, and depending on the nature of the model and the number of material constants, either a linear or nonlinear regression method is used to minimize it. The minimized value of this error function is called as residue, and it can be used to compare the quality of fit between two different models. Now let's look at a demo of how to perform this curve fitting in Workbench using engineering data. Here is the data for an elastomer sample. The data set includes uniaxial tension, biaxial tension, and in shear. This includes data in three modes of deformation. We don't have any volumetric data, so it's assumed that the material is fully incompressible. 
Notice that the three responses have a point of inflection in their response. This generally implies that the material response may be made of two or more terms. We'll see how the quality of it improves as we use modes with more terms. As a first step, let's open Workbench and insert a new static structural module. Go to Engineering Data, add a new material, and name it as Elastomer. Next, right mouse click and include property on uniaxial test data, biaxial test data, and shear test data from toolbox under Harper Elastic Experimental Data. Make sure that the project units are set to the same units as data and then copy the data to the respective objects. Next, we pick a hyperelastic model from the toolbox and perform curve fitting. For starters, let's use Neohuken model, which is considered a simple hyperelastic model. You'll notice that the option to perform curve fitting appears. Notice that one case uses either a normalizer error or an absolute error. This is the same as the error function that we discussed earlier. The difference between the two is that in case of normalized error, norm each datum is given equal weight during the optimization. The choice of error norm depends on the data at hand, so it's always recommended to check the quality of the fit for both the norms and pick the best. Let's solve the curve fit using normalized error first. Here is the solution. We can see that it follows the data fairly well, but does not capture the shape of the curve very well. Let's change the error norm to absolute and see if that makes any difference. There's not much improvement in the quality of fit, so let's proceed to add more terms. Since Neohuken model only has one term, we'll use your second order model, which has quadratic term in addition to the Neohuken model. Once again, solve for the curve fit using normalized error. While there isn't much improvement in the uniaxial and shear responses, the biaxial response is dropping down with strain, which indicates that it's unstable. Let's see if using absolute error gives us a better fit. We can see that the quality of fit is better compared to the normalized error norm, but it still doesn't properly capture the shape of the curve. Let's add another term by using the third order model. Solving for normalized error, it's hard to see how well the response is captured due to the auto limits on the axis. Let's change the limits on y axis from 0 to 3 megapascals so we can make a better comparison. Right click on y axis and select edit properties. Uncheck the automatic range and set the minimum and maximum limits to 0 and 3 megapascals. Now we can see the quality of fit. It seems to be capturing the inflection point. Let's change the norm to absolute error and see if there is an improvement. This is clearly a much better fit compared to the models of so far. There is still some room for improvement and perhaps one could use better nonlinear models for better results. But at the sake of this demo, let's stop brushing the apple and eat it. Before we proceed further, it's important to see if the calculated values make physical sense. One way of doing this sanity check is to calculate the initial shear modules for your third order model, this is nothing but the 2 times C10. Notice that one term has negative coefficient, but the total initial shear modulus comes to be around 1.4 megapascals, which looks reasonable. So right click on the model and copy calculated values to property. This completes the calibration of the model, and now let's go ahead to mechanical and perform a simulation using this model. 
In this demo, we'll simulate the uniaxial tension of a unit cube. The cube is fixed in x, y, and z direction on three faces, and the other three faces are left free to deform. By doing so, we are creating a state of uniform deformation in the cube. Attach the geometry and open mechanical. Assign material elastomer to the body under geometry in the tree. Now define a mesh body sizing on the cube and set the element size equal to the length of the side. By doing so, we are creating what is called as single element model. This is a popular technique used for testing the response of the material models, as all other model complexities are stripped off. Select the face perpendicular to the x-axis and define a displacement condition and set x equal to zero. Now repeat the same step to fix the neighboring faces in y and z directions. Next, select the other face that is normal to y-axis and define a displacement load of 0.7 meters. This completes defining the loads and boundary conditions. Next, go to analysis settings and set large reflections to on. Hyperelastic models are nonlinear in nature and therefore they use large deflection theory. Next, set the time stepping to off and set the number of sub-steps to 10. A typical simulation using hyperelastic material models may benefit from using auto time stepping, but due to the simplicity of the model, we may turn it off. This completes the model setup. Go ahead and solve the model. Now that the solution is available, go ahead and drag and drop the displacement object that was used to define loading to solution to create a force reaction probe to displacement object. Note that the area of cross section of the cube in undeformed configuration is one meter square and the ratio of reaction force to initial area of cross section is engineering stress in the material. Therefore, the numerical value reported by this force reaction probe is equal to the engineering stress in the part in Pascal units. Also, the ratio of displacement in Y to its length in Y, which is 1 meter, is same as engineering strain. Therefore, the numerical values reported by the force displacement chart from this unit cube are equal to the engineering stress and engineering strain developed in the material. So let's go ahead and create a force displacement chart to extract this data in a tape. Select force reaction object and displacement object from model tree and insert chart. Set the X axis to maximum of displacement, set time to omit. What we have here are equal to values of engineering stresses and strains. Comparing them against the data we input earlier, we can see that they correlate very well. This concludes the demo. Now let's summarize what we learned in this video. Curve fitting is used for calibrating hyperelastic models based on experimental data. We need only one mode of deformation to calibrate the model, but it's highly recommended to have data from all modes of deformation for accuracy. Remember that curve fitting is only returning the optimum values and user must verify the values to check if they make physical sense before proceeding using them in analysis. Single element models are very useful in testing the material model since we can achieve uniform deformation. I hope that you found this video informative. Please share the video, post your comments and subscribe to this channel to stay updated. Don't forget to visit courses.ansys.com to discover more useful courses.